This is um, Acts 10, 36 to 48. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed, because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, and they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. We are in the book of Acts. It's called um, Movement Ignites. We've been here for several weeks. And really what we're going to see today is that the gospel is jumping the firewall. So it's going from being contained just to the Jews to extending out to the Gentiles and really every race and ethnicity across the entire world. Um, Along Another idea that we can go with rather than kind of a fire theme would be a virus theme, um, which I got really excited about because I'm really into zombies. Um, I watch a lot of zombie movies, and so I I really started to kind of go far down the road of talking a lot about zombies, but then I realized that my main practice partner was my wife, and she is terrified of zombies. And for me to practice this in front of her would have just not been good for our marriage. So I decided to go in a different direction. We're going to go a little bit more positively. So rather than a virus, we're going to go with a vaccine that can prevent a virus that would bring an otherwise debilitating and um, incurable disease. So let's take polio as an example. Uh, For many of us in this room, it's something that maybe we've heard of before, maybe we've seen some old pictures, but we likely haven't witnessed it ourselves. We haven't seen people with polio. Polio is highly contagious, so it's very effective at transmitting from person to person very quickly, and the symptoms can be horrific. So you can have uh, deforted, uh, deformed limbs, and your body can get all contorted. In the worst case scenario, it can actually attack your central nervous system, so you become permanently paralyzed. And that can be one of kind of the main images that we think of of polio as um, being paralyzed. But why haven't we seen polio? What what happened? Why was it something that was popular then, but not now? It's because it took a sharp decline in the 1950s. And about 25 years ago, it was actually declared eradicated in the United States. And so I think we have a photo of, um, of polio. And so it's, it's, it's black and white. And for me, that's, that's what polio is. That's what polio is. It's black and white. But to my grandparents, it would have been in color. Because for them, it was very real. It was very uneradicated. It was very scary. So in the 1920s, 1930s, here in the United States, we saw polio just skyrocket because we were changing the way that we lived, and this particular virus kind of took advantage of that. Um, So it was becoming very prevalent here in the U.S., and doctors were seeing that in other places of the world, it was actually infecting entire cities. And our people were hearing about this, and they were getting very worried. And so polio was scary not only because of how quickly it could spread or because of the disabilitating effects it had on the body, but because it was also incurable. So if you're a parent at this time, you can feel just helpless, and you're going to the doctor and you're asking, what can I do um, to prevent this from happening? And at that time, what the doctors were saying was, don't let your kid get cold, don't let them get overtired, whatever that means, and don't let them mix with other kids. So what, that, what happened is parents were just barricading their kids inside. Um, whole communities were taking action along this, and they were shutting down community pools as they found out that water was one of the ways that it got transferred. So across the whole nation, we saw that fear was sweeping through. 
And then finally people just said, enough is enough. We're not going to take this anymore. We're going to try to find a vaccine for polio. So the whole nation mobilized. One of the uh, organizations that, that came out of this was the March of Dimes, um, something that's still around today. They're working on different projects now. But this is when the March of Dimes started, and they were literally going around and collecting dimes. And it took 10 years, but after all this medical research that was done because of the money that was raised through the March of Dimes and other places, we had our first major breakthrough, and we can call it the Hammond's immunization. And it was a breakthrough, and it was good news in that it would stop polio for some people that had it. If they had the right um, gene makeup, then it would stop, but it didn't work for everybody. And on top of that, it required tons of blood in order to get to that immunization. And it was just really impractical amount, so they couldn't spread that across um, everyone in the U.S. So they continued working. They wanted to find something that was better than that. And after a couple more years, they finally came up with the polio vaccine. And this was kind of good news all around. It was highly effective. It was easy to administer by nearly anyone. And it was virtually free to create. And about 60 years later, it's essentially the same vaccine that we have today. So it's um, 99 plus percent effective. It can be given through an eyedropper orally, just like here. So you don't need to be a doctor or a nurse. Um, even I could administer something like this. And the cost is only 60 cents. So for a couple quarters and a dime, a child can be um, safeguarded against having polio for their entire life. And so that happened in the 1950s. That's where we saw such a huge drop-off. Um, and it was, became eradicated here in the United States in the late 1980s. And so at that time, um, some more organizations came together and said, wow, if we can eradicate it here in the U.S., that means we should be able to eradicate it in, across the entire world. So about 30 years ago, that's when they started doing that. And in 2012, the number of new polio cases was below 300. So it went from hundreds of thousands of cases every year to less than 300. It's one of the most ambitious human initiatives that we've ever undertaken. But if we look at that as, as a human achievement, it's really nothing compared to our mission as Christians and as a church, neither in the scope of what we're trying to achieve or in the power that we possess. Throughout the first nine chapters of Acts, we see that the gospel is spreading. Um, and like I said before, it was really only amongst the Jews, and the Jews thought it was, it was kind of only for them. They couldn't really believe that this was going to be an all-inclusive, um, global-type solution. Um, but in these verses, we're going to see that. Um, we're kind of in a three-week story. We're in, the, we're in the middle. So Shannon kicked us off last week, um, and it's all about Peter and Cornelius coming together. Um, and now Peter is at Cornelius' house. Uh, Cornelius is a centurion. Um, he's invited all of his family, his friends, his servants, his soldiers to hear what Peter has to say. And after a number of false starts, because Peter didn't know why he was there, he finally got it. He's like, oh, I'm supposed to bring the gospel message to these Gentiles. And now, so that's where we're going to pick up this week is in Peter's sermon to the Gentiles. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Power, with the Holy Spirit, and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We see here that the gospel starts with Jesus, that the gospel is accomplished through Jesus, that the gospel is all about Jesus. So now that Peter finally knows why he's here, he's bringing Jesus. He's bringing the gospel message. He says that during Jesus' life, that he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for the God was, was with him. Now, Peter would have known as much about Jesus as anyone else on earth. He spent three years going from town to town, walking with Jesus. He was eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner with Jesus. He was going on these epic boat rides that, that we read in the gospel messages with Jesus. So he knew him through and through. But Peter knew that he was more than just a regular good guy, that he was a supernaturally good guy, that he was perfect, and that he was sinless. 
Over and over again, Peter would see Jesus being not just a nice guy, but the most loving person on earth. That he didn't just bring wisdom, um, or that he was just smart, but the wisdom that he brought shook the entire foundations of the world. That he didn't just make people feel better, but that he would miraculously heal them. It's actually possible that Jesus healed people with polio. Because it's a virus that's been around for thousands of years. So Peter saw all this physical side of everything, but he also saw this spiritual dimension. That Jesus wasn't just amazing in the good deeds that he did, but that he opposed evil itself. And not just evil in a, in a vague sense, but in the leader of all evil, the devil. A person who goes back all the way to the early chapters of Genesis. And so Peter saw that Jesus had power over people that were uh, demon-possessed and that um, he took them out of them. And so we see here that Jesus cares about the spiritual realm as well. And so both because of all the physical realities of the world and the, the, the spiritual dimension that is just under the surface of everything that we can touch and feel, we can see that the world is broken. And that's why Jesus came, because the world is broken. When we see... Um, photos of polio that is, are still taking place um, in the world today. We can't help but just be sad, um, be outraged that this is happening, um, that this is still happening. Um, and there's all their forms of pain and suffering that we experience on a regular basis to tell us that this isn't how things are supposed to be, that the world is, re- is really messed up. But Jesus does care, and while he was here in his ministry time, he was bringing his power, and he showed that he had authority. In this verse, and kind of throughout our entire passage today, we see that Jesus wasn't alone, that he had the Holy Spirit, and that everything he did was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Um, We can think of the Holy Spirit like telephone poles going down a major road. Um, I think of it, so I, I go down the same road every day, back and forth. And usually I don't see the telephone poles that are there until I'm like stuck in traffic or maybe an accident has happened in front of me and then they kind of pop into view. And so, of course, they've been there the entire time. I just noticed them. So they've been transmitting power and lines of communication um, the entire time. And if we were to take those telephone poles out, then we'd be without power. We'd be without communication. Um, So just um, like telephone poles, the Holy Spirit has been bringing power throughout Acts He's bringing it through Jesus um, in this passage. And so in summary, um, in this first part, we can see that Jesus was was a supernaturally good guy, that he was perfect, that he was miraculous, um, that he was one of a kind. He's telling this all to Cornelius and his household. They're in Caesarea, which is about 30 miles from um, Nazareth, where Jesus was from. Um, And so Peter kind of starts with his life, but he really focuses more on being a witness to Jesus' death and resurrection. Peter continues, They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So Peter is compactly able to say that Jesus was murdered by men on the cross and that he was resurrected by God from the grave. That this supernatural life that Jesus had at first really kind of just continued into his afterlife. But who put Jesus to death? Who put Jesus um, on that tree? It's a lot of people. Uh, We can start with the Jews. So these were the very people that Jesus came to preach his good news, um, to fulfill all the prophecy in the Old Testament. He came, and they were the ones that were going to the Roman government, pleading with them that he needs to be crucified. It was also the Jewish rulers um, who saw Jesus as a... um, as a threat, really, as as a rival to their current um, seat of power. So it was the Jews. It was also the Roman government and the military. Uh, We see in the gospel messages that even though Pontius Pilate saw that Jesus had no wrongdoing, that he was innocent, that he still killed Jesus because he was afraid of this Jewish mob that threatened to revolt if if he didn't crucify him. So he just collapsed under that pressure. 
this is a little bit more indirect, but even the house at where Peter is at now in our story, he's at a centurion's house. So this is the military organization that is the one who actually executed Jesus. So we can see here that everyone then had their, um, all their hands were bloody. Um, and similar, I think this was in the, in the first song that John led us through, um, we recognize that, um, that when I do recognize my own sin and my own rebellion, I admit that his blood is on my hands as well. That when I'm really honest with myself that I don't want to follow Jesus, that I don't want to follow um, the God who created me, that I want to be my own God instead and I don't want to have any rivals. And that if I would have been there, I would have wanted Jesus dead just as much as the next guy. So in the cross, we see man's sin at its worst, but we also see God's love at its best. And that's because what man meant for evil, God worked out for good. That through the death of Jesus, he was received as a sacrifice for all humans. And that through the cross, Jesus bore man's sin, and he took away God's wrath. So after being um, killed on the cross, he was buried for three days, and then he was resurrected. And so what this means is that Jesus defeated death, that he has triumphed over death. And because of all of this, because of Jesus' life, because of um, his death, because he was resurrected, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The Apostle Paul in Romans 10 uh, writes, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If I sincerely believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, if I've surrendered to him as my Lord, then I'm innocent before God. And I'm not innocent because of anything that I've done. There's nothing that I can do to, to earn it. But it's all based on Jesus' merits. Jesus is the one that makes me innocent. So even though sin has infected me like polio, and on the inside I am deformed and contorted and paralyzed, Jesus has brought a cure. And it's Jesus' blood. The blood of Christ has saved me from the crippling entrapment of sin. Now, of course, Peter believed this. Peter believed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And now he's bearing witness to Cornelius and his household in our passage today. Now, this idea of being a witness is hammered throughout Acts. Um, in prepping for this sermon, I just started in Acts 1 and went all the way through where we are today. And witness is over and over and over again. And even in our passage today, it's mentioned three times. First, in verse 39, And we are witnesses of all that Jesus did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Then again in verse 41, Not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses. And then finally in verse 43, To him all the prophets bear witness. So the apostles bear witness, the prophets bear witness, who have been um, chosen by God to be in his family, are witnesses. There's this continuous chain of witnesses and that we're a part of that. We are a part of a continuous chain of witnesses of Jesus. All of the Old Testament is building up towards Jesus. So all of the history that's there, all the law, all the prophecies are pointing towards Jesus. When Jesus came and just before he was about to be ascended up into heaven, one of the last, one of the last few words that he said um, to his disciples were to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. And so that's what Peter is doing here. He is bearing witness. Um, he's effectively bringing the gospel vaccine to the Gentiles. And when Peter brings the gospel message, the Holy Spirit comes in power. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. 
And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Now we likely don't appreciate these couple of verses, how momentous they are, how earth-shattering they are. But the Jews that were with Peter, the buddies that, that, Jesus, that Peter brought along with him, they got it. They knew how big of a deal this was. It says, And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. And that's, that's how the processing, even on the Gentiles, because for centuries there's been this very strong separation between Jews and Gentiles. So between the Jews and then basically the 99% of other people that were inhabiting the earth. And now they're kind of seeing, they're finally recognizing, oh, these are going to be our brothers and sisters in Christ. If we think back to that first polio immunization, that it worked for some, but it didn't work for everyone. And even for the people it did work for, there was a massive amount of blood that was required in order for it um, to work. We can think of that first polio immunization as what the Jews had in the law. The Jews had for thou- or for hundreds of years, um, they had this sacrificial system where every time I sin, I go to the temple, sacrifice an animal, blood is let out, and then I'm innocent again before God in, in a way. So there's some similarities there, but that, that Jewish system, the Old Testament law, it didn't work for anyone who wasn't practicing it. So everyone else was just doomed. So we see here that um, the law was just a stopgap, that it wasn't a cure for everyone. Whereas if we compare that with the genuine vaccine that was discovered, that was effective, it was easy to administer, it was low in cost, we can really compare that with Jesus and the gospel that he brought through his life, death, and resurrection. We can see that it's available to everyone. Um, In this very passage, we see that it's available to Jews and Gentiles. In modern day terms, it's available to Americans and Canadians and Colombians and Um, Indians and Egyptians. It's available to the rich and the poor, to the blue collar and the white collar. It's available to everyone. And it can be shared by anyone. You don't need to be a priest or a pope or Shannon or me or uh, Tina Carmichael. You don't need to be anyone special in a sense. You just have to have the message yourself. And then finally, it costs us nothing to share. So once I have the gospel message, I can go out and it doesn't take away anything that I have. Because Jesus already paid with his life. So Jesus paid the cost so that we could have the gospel and share it freely. And this was all hitting the Jews that were there. That's why they were amazed. Even though that they had gotten the vaccine themselves, it was hard for them to overcome this idea that they were to go out and to share it. That the vaccine was for the Gentiles. And that really that the vaccine is for us. Right, Because we're in the story. We, we aren't Jews. We don't have Jewish heritage. We're Gentiles. And so these are our ancestors receiving the gospel message for the first time in Mass. And we can see that there's a chain reaction taking place. Um, both here in the gospel messages is going to go on in a geography. It's going out from um, Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. But it's also gone through time. That for the last 2,000 years, there's been links in the chain that go all the way up to us. And that we are that current link in the chain. That we are to be Jesus' witnesses to those living across the street, to across the the tracks, and to the very ends of the earth. So just as there's been a coalition to eradicate polio from the earth, That's kind of the purpose of the church, that we are to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. Um, For the last 20, 30 years, people have been bringing the polio vaccine into the jungles of the Congo and the deserts of India and the suburbs of Seattle. We're to be going out with the good news of Jesus. That's our mission, is to be witnesses. So in the first part, Peter preaches the gospel. The Holy Spirit comes in power. And now the celebration can begin. The Peter, then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. 
Peter sees undeniably that the Holy Spirit has come down on the Gentile people. Peter's seen this a number of times now. There was something that we call Pentecost that happened in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit came down in mass on the Jewish people. And he's kind of comparing what has just happened to that and what happened then. He's like, well, these are really similar. I think all these people believe in Jesus. They all have the Holy Spirit now. And now that means we need to baptize them. Um, clearly, no one can withhold baptizing these people. Baptism means to dunk, to bathe, to wash. And that's what we're kind of symbolizing in water baptism. And that's what, that's, what we see water, and that's what we see baptism as. is It's just an outward symbol of an inward reality that's already happened in my heart, that I've already accepted Jesus Christ um, into my life. And there's three reasons why we practice water baptisms. The first is obedience. Jesus commanded that we do water baptisms. Before he ascended into heaven, he gave the great commission that a lot of us are familiar with. One of the, the parts in there is that one of the ways to commission a new disciple is that they would be baptized. The second reason is that we're announcing to the world, to our family and our friends and our neighbors, that this is where we're putting our eternal trust in. We're making a statement. And then thirdly, we're celebrating our reconciliation with our Creator. So it is uh, kind of a party in a sense. And really, now the more that we get into it, we can really see that this vaccine metaphor breaks down. Because a vaccine prevents a disease from happening. Whereas the gospel cures us from a disease that we already have and that we can't cure ourselves. With a vaccine, we can just take it once and we're protected for the rest of our life. But the gospel isn't to be viewed as just our ticket to heaven. That um, I say a prayer, Jesus comes into my heart, and then I live my life as if it never happened. Because really, we're not taking the gospel so we can avoid hell, but that we can get Jesus forever. Um, the gospel is not just a one-time thing in the sense that it saves us, but it's also continually sanctifying us. That through the Holy Spirit and, and the gospel message, it's coming into my heart, it's enlightening my mind, and that Hopefully, I'm continuing to become more and more like Jesus every day. And I think that's why Cornelius' household wanted Peter and the other Jews to say it was so that they could learn more. Because even though something really extraordinary happened, something miraculous happened, they wanted to learn more. So we can see that the gospel is infinitely better than any vaccine could be and that it's worth celebrating. And through baptism, we celebrate a reconciliation with Jesus. And so really what we're going to be doing here at Mosaic is we're kind of just following Peter's lead. Um, we're sharing the gospel, and then we're asking people to come up and be baptized. Um, we're going to be doing that again in August, that if you believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, if uh, you surrendered to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you haven't been baptized yet, then we ask you to come and talk with us. You can talk with me after service. You can talk with someone at the welcome desk. You can talk with, with Shannon. Because this is something that we want to celebrate with you. We think it's a really big deal, um, and it's just a great opportunity. Um, but if all this seems foreign to you, um, if Jesus is um, just a guy that you're kind of starting to believe in, that, that he was around, maybe that he was a good guy, um, but you haven't put... Um, you still have all these puzzle pieces and they're not put together yet. Um, and you have lots of questions. You have questions about the resurrection. You have questions about sin. You have questions about heaven. Then we ask you just to keep coming back on Sunday mornings. We're going to continue on through the book of Acts. Um, we'll get back into um, Matthew to an earlier part in the gospel messages. Um, we also ask that you plug into uh, what we call missional communities or small groups. These are, are groups of people that are meeting throughout the week to try to live out what we talk about on Sundays. You know, so we don't want to be, be hypocrites that we just come in here for an hour and then kind of disregard that until next Sunday. But we actually want to try to live this out. We want to be salt and light to the world. And one of the ways we do that is by being in community. Um, and we think all this is important because while the Holy Spirit kind of fell immediately after hearing the gospel message with these first Gentiles, it was a pretty extraordinary thing. Um, and in my experience, that's not how it happened at all. Um, it, for me, it was over the course of three years of hearing messages on Sunday mornings, of reading God's Word myself, of being in a gospel community that was trying to live out um, what the Bible says, that um, my heart finally connected all the dots, that the Holy Spirit fell on me personally. Um, 
And that's because the Holy Spirit has his own pace. Um, he has plans for each of us. We can't manipulate anyone to accepting the gospel, and we can't you know, put that on a timetable. But we do know that with increased exposure and intensity, um, we see the Holy Spirit working. So um, we just ask that if, if you're new here, that you just continue to keep coming back. Um, I'm going to close us in prayer, and the band will come up to lead us in more worship. Thank you, Lord, uh, for the opportunity to share your word with the people of Mosaic today. Um, thank you for including Peter's gospel message to the Gentiles um, so that in a way we can see our ancestors receive your grace and your mercy. Um, through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, I am able to see that I am more wretched and sinful than I ever dare believe. And yet at the same time, I am more loved and accepted than I ever dared hope. God, I ask that you work in each of our hearts, um, that wherever our relationship is with you, that it would grow deeper, that through hearing your word and through reading the Bible and through uh, participating in the Mosaic community, that we'd better grasp the gospel for our everyday life. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, may we be witnesses to those across the street, across the tracks, and all the way to the ends of the earth. That we be witnesses, not because we have to, but because we get to, Lord. That because you've given us the most valuable gift to share with everyone in the whole world. May we be so enamored by it that we can't hoard it to ourselves, but are compelled to share it with others. Amen.